Okay, so hopefully this is working, guys, and hopefully you can hear me. Uh, so today I'm supposed to be having a chat with Landon. Testing, but... testing, testing. Oh, oh, there you are. <laughs> ciao, ciao, ciao. Yeah, how's it going? Oh, things are doing well. How about your folk, folks? Uh, well, for me, it's good. Uh, Ruben and Chris, I don't know what they're doing. So I'm just in my place right now. All right. Uh, just a second. All right, this is actually the first time I've uh, streamed on Google Hangouts. So it looks like it's working, but hopefully the audience can hear us. Do they have any, uh, uh, 3.9 quake, earthquake here. That was kind of fun. Oh, wow. Well, that's, well, I mean, that's, nice. that's not, that's not too huge, right? I don't no, know. It's, 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 it's a nice little, uh, <laughs> nice little event. <laughs> I'll have to see how my interns, uh, liked it. So. All right. All right. So, uh, Landon, it is awesome to have you here. Uh, when, uh, when you first uh, started following us and started commenting in our streams, I was like, you know, I kind of, I recognize that name from somewhere, but I was never sure where. And then, uh, King Crocoduck brought you up in a stream he was doing and I was like, wait, that's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Crocoduck and I uh, go back a, a little ways there. He's a, he's actually a pretty, uh, a pretty amazing guy working on, um, actually the kind of combination of physics and, um, and physiology cardiology and since I had my since I had a heart valve repair we actually had a you know nice uh, nice chat on stuff but he's he's doing um, some pretty important work in studying um, the physics of the heart oh that's, that's awesome I didn't know he was doing them I mean I, fo I follow that, that that's his <laughs> thesis of, of stuff when he's not doing you gotcha. know, <laughs> his his videos there but gotcha um, yeah I mean I'm, I'm a fan of his stuff I mean it's great learning about physics like that and uh, even though I've read, like, some amount of books on physics, you know, like, five, six books on physics, like, uh, it's not too much, obviously, but it's more than some people. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I just love that kind of stuff. And recently, uh, I've also been uh, seeing you in a lot of debate groups and a lot of discussions uh, which was really awesome uh, to see, but it always seems like you don't really get uh, was you, you can't really get your foot in the door. Like well, there, are, well, there are a bunch of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Sometimes, I mean, some sometimes I think the art of discussion is lost on on people, um, and that may be due to the culture of of certain news type programs where the moderator's here and two people are here and they yell at each other and no information is exchanged. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was actually, I, you know, I was um, clued into you guys through um, my contacts at the Dawkins Foundation. And well, they mentioned, <laughs> and, and I mentioned that, you know, guys were doing this, this sort of Sunday school thing with uh, reading the, the Bible um, and various stuff. So that's how I, I, I I came across you folks there, so. Whoa, that is. On <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know if that's where my name was now. Okay, I mean that's all right. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Well, they said you know that, that the Milwaukee atheist is sort of a spot there and, and there, and so I, I it's one of the things that on Sunday is I sort of you know oftentimes put on in the background while I'm doing things. Well, you know this this stuff is reaching mm -hmm. over me for for the because I um I. T I grew up in a, in a fundamentalist Baptist uh, household. Mm, yeah, reading, actually, I, I was actually going to ask you pretty much about how you you became an atheist because I, I didn't know anything about your your background at all. Yeah, and so it was it was that that was fundamentalist uh, American Baptist, and um, I uh, decided to excel in Bible trivia. And so when there was vacation Bible school and they had obscure questions about blah, 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 you know, I knew that the, 
that they would not dive into sort of the obvious parts of the Bible. They would dive into places like Leviticus and Numbers and that sort of thing. So I, I spent some time trying to grok that stuff. Um, also, in our area at the time was a, um, a very early Christian radio station called Family Radio that was actually run in part by this guy named Harold Camping. You might remember oh, his name. Yeah. And, um, and my, my theory on Harold Camping was that, you know, he probably had some kind of brain tumor problems because the Harold Camping that I knew as an early child would not have tolerated, I believe, the Harold Camping that was, uh, that he's more known for by his, his stuff. So he, he was, for example, the early Harold Camp is very critical of anyone, for example, trying to uh, state the date when the Lord was going to return, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that Harold Camping used to do was for an hour just read the Bible and he would go through the stuff, just like you are doing. That, <laughs> except what, what we lacked was that commentary of like, well, what did, wait a minute, what did they say about cloth or this sort of odd, odd stuff there. Um, and to some extent, reading, actually reading the Bible was something that was not encouraged. Bible, I, I mean, as opposed to Bible study. Bible study is where, where a bunch of like-minded people would get around and group reinforce the, the beliefs. Yes. And if you had, oh, that seems odd, that was, you know, that was doubt, right? And you had to like yeah. pray that away, right? And as opposed to really studying it. So that's kind of uh, back to your sort of your your your, uh, your 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 reading the Bible and the commentary that goes along with it. I think that's something that um, Christians need to be encouraged to do. Um, and 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 you know, historically, I'm talking about you know, 500 years ago. Uh, a lay person reading the Bible without the guidance of a priest was discouraged. Huh, that's, that, that's in interesting. Some, I mean, in some circles, right? In okay. some circles, that was, that was discouraged. That was the jobs of the priest. You went to church, to mass, so the priest would intercede on your behalf. Yeah. And, and that's a form of don't you critically think, right? That's, that's the, the thing. Um, I think the transition that I started was um, um, I, I call it my refusal to commit intellectual suicide. Mm, that's and, good. I like that. And that for me was what I was being asked to do when, you know, I, when some of these more uh, uh, um, radical ideas about, you know, the Bible being literally true and let's force reality to have a you know, six-day creation and a 6,000-year-old earth and some of these other things, the flood stuff. Um, you know, that you had on one side at, at, our, at our church, you had people who would sort of say, well, it's really metaphorical, it's really blah, blah, blah. And you had this growing tide of, it's literally God's word and how dare you question. You know, reality is wrong if it disagrees with God's word. And that was something that I, I, I um, had problems with. You know, our family also um, was also very musical. I mean, music was a, was a very important part of our family. And I'm talking about, you know, classical music um, in, in there. And so um, I grew up in the, in the church choir singing. And um, as, even as a little kid, I had a, a nice bar uh, bass baritone <laughs> voice. Um, and and that was a so so that sort of the music held, kept me going in the church much longer than might not otherwise because we actually had a, a very decent choir director and we would sing you know uh, Mozart and we'd sing other sort of things that in, in, in church um, and there was a there was a big shift to say well let's do the happy songs with the with a little bouncing ball of the of the words in the back of the cathedral as opposed to you read music and you know you did you know Brahms Requiem and other sorts of cool mm -hmm. stuff so um, uh, I think when it was kind of turning the tide towards, I would maybe sort of modern evangelical classical, modern evangelical stuff. Um, you know, I had this sort of back and forth between the social aspects of it, the, the cultural aspects of church, 
and this new rising sort of fundamentalism going. Um, my brother, older brother, three years older, uh, was the first ones to really begin to rebel against sort of the Sunday school stuff. And he was asking the difficult questions. Um, I didn't really ask the difficult question. I'm, I'm, I'm less confrontational, but in my own mind, the confrontation was there. And so I just chose to just tear down everything and tear down my belief structure and say, if I believe it, I will question it. Why? Because I came to it through um, parental and societal peer pressure. So let me tear that all down and build up something that I'm comfortable with. Was, uh, was that like a single moment or was that a slow build up over time? Well, it was a slow build over time, although I chose a dramatic moment. Uh, to do that, uh, I remember I was I was at the church, and there was a thing about you know suggesting um, a um, suggesting hymns to sing sort of thing. It was like mm -hmm. a, it was the right. Sunday evening sort of more casual service, and I picked a um, I picked a particular tune that was um, actually all the same written to the same music as the German national anthem <laughs> and decided at that point was my time to sort of say, you know, they started singing and I decided to walk out of the church with that that music playing in the background. Um, now, of course, they weren't singing the German national anthem, they were singing the other, the Baptist version of, of things. But to me, that was kind of my way of saying, you know, this is what I think of your, uh, of your foundation. Now, it took me a while to transition from um, I'm not going to church to I'm not uh, comfortable with identifying myself as a Christian. That took much longer. And here the social aspects of it was, was is, is, is a problem. If, if you grow up in the church and you're, all your friends are in the church and everything's around church, the church calendar and so forth, it's hard to, um, to extract yourself from there. And that, so, but that helped by, you know, my moving out of the house, getting a job, going to college, those sorts of things. Um, but, it, you... it, it, but, but the science was something that bothered me uh, where it was conflicting with religion and the idea was, you know, Let's warp science so this view of the view of the Bible uh, stands. Yeah, there was there was a some book that Ruben bought recently, and it was kind of old, like 30, 40 years old, somewhere around there, and it was basically just Christian science science apologetics yeah and it was trying to prove ah oh, here's how a flood could happen here's how you explain all the fossils and shit like that and it was trying to be so scientific but like lacked everything in core concepts uh so what did you did you actually lose religion before you got into like the serious sciences or did you get into the serious sciences and realize, oh, this is a bunch of bullshit. I mean, I think sciences was something that, that, that um, was very early in, in, my, in my being. Um, I remember I was, I was 20 months old um, when I spoke my first complete sentence. And my very first complete sentence was a question, which is a good thing for scientists. Yeah. And my question, which was a really good thing for an astronomer, was how far is the sun? Right before it had been Dada and Google and all that sort of you know kid type things, but I was uh, we we grew up on a farm in the East Bay Hills of of the San Francisco Bay Area in California, United States, and we were on the ridge line and we could see from our vantage point from San Jose down what became the Silicon Valley all the way up through San Francisco and 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 Golden Gate Bridge was sort of our panorama, and it was at the dinner time I was watching the sun. As I've yeah, done countless times before, set over the over the peninsula, and and I will admit I, I, that that my view of cosmology at the time 
again, 20 months old, yeah. was, well, there's the world, right? There's the edge. There's, you know, it, it, it now, um, I heard about, you know, the, the, the you know, flat earth uh, thing, although I thought it was kind of odd, because I, I, you know, when someone said, is the world flat, I said, no, the world's not flat, it's lumpy. <laughs> you can see lumps, right? Because, you know, me, flat meant right, right. a plane, right? But, but in the context of what I understood of it being, um, I was seeing what I thought was the sun setting right over there. So I thought it would be really cool if we could go over there and watch the sun closer to, to go <laughs> over the edge. And so that is why I, in thinking about this, I came up with the need to ask my parents a question and put together the words, how far is the sun? Which they were surprised I said that. So my parents, in response, and again, this is, this is you know, what wonderful parents they were, went, they didn't know exactly, but they went to a book that they had on their shelf called Questions Children Ask. And I still have that book. And they went to the page where it said, how far is the sun? And they had this, um, in the United States, we have these uh, interstate highway signs, right, with, with yeah. mileage on there. And so there was a picture of the sun, this internet highway sign, and it said sun, you know, 93 million miles. Sorry, it was miles and not metric. Um, <laughs> and I looked at all those digits, right, and I said, you know, and first, my first thing, again, this is part of the questioning, as I said, that seems like an awfully large number. Now, I understand that we had driven several times to grandmother's house, which is up in Oregon, and it took 515 miles to get there. And, and if I watch the odometer, you know, sometime during the trip, the thousands number would tick once, right, on, on the round trip. And here I was seeing 93 million, I mean, much bigger than could even fit on a car's odometer. And I knew on, on the farm you have these surveying tapes. And at that time, the longest surveying tape we had was a major tape was 100 feet. And I was thinking, I was thinking, how in the world did someone take a tape measure? <laughs> and extend it out to get to the sun. That seems like too big of a number to, to... And so the other thing I did that was very important scientifically, my second sentence I spoke, complete sentence I spoke, was why? That, that's a good one. That's a good one. It's a <laughs> and, classic. And, and, and what I was trying to say, I, I, if I had the words to think, you know, and figure out how to think, I should have said... How, that seems like a very big number. How are they so sure that anything is that big, right? How do they know? Um, and, but, you know, uh, uh, that began all these sort of question things there. So, so science and numbers was, was in, 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 you know, inside me from, from an extremely early age. And it wasn't until I was nine that I went to, uh, a planetarium show, a uh, Morrison Planetarium in San Francisco, where it was on the quest for the solar parallax and transit of Venus, right? And I watched this thing, and they talked about a method developed by Isaac Newton and Edmund Halley, of Halley's Comet fame, on how you could use timing of the transit of Venus to m directly measure the distance of Venus and therefore the, to the sun. And I remember the person there saying, but these transit beings are very rare. Again, this is in 1969. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're going to have to wait all the way to the year 2004 before you see one of these things. And so the kid, I said, okay, that's, that's what I have to do. Then I wait for there. And, and, and so that began this preparation as an astronomer, as a scientist. And it was, um, it was one of the joys of my life to be, I was in the Arcetri Observatory um, in, in, in Italy, uh, north of Florence. And in fact, you know, the director of the observatory, a great, the, a great man named Franco Bacini, the sort of the, calls, calls the father of the neutron star, um, heard about my event. I had a colleague that was in Madagascar, and the two of us were gonna do the, the, the transit measuring. And we, um, and, and so he actually had us go, uh, not at the observatory, but, but to go uh, about a kilometer down to the villa where Galileo had been kept in prison and had, us, had me do the measurement from the balcony. Once a week, the Coxley Church would let Galileo out on the balcony, not to talk to anyone, but just you know, out for a little bit of air once a week. And so I thought it was quite fitting to do the measurement 
from that balcony that Galileo uh, for seven, you know, I think something like 17 years was, that was his only view on the world. Um, otherwise he was kept in prison uh, as a fitting, uh, a, a fitting thing. But the other thing of course was the other interaction with that was um, I had an opportunity to go to Blair House which is the residence of the vice president. And in Blair House is also the, the official part of the Naval Observatory. In that house are uh, records from the Naval Observatory that are um, uh, there in, in, and there's a record in there, um, it's a letter from the astronomers of, of 1882 to the astronomers of 2004 where the people who did the previous transit of Venus talked about their experiment, what went wrong, what went right, and some very important suggestions. Um, and so we followed that and, and we did the experiment in 2004 and 2012, got a very good um, um, error estimate. There's actually a whole web page on, uh, on this experiment we did and the measuring, which is, which is kind of funny that when I get into discussions with flat earthers um, and they talk about the sun being blah, 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 because they, they try to construct this. Yeah. This thing, and again, by the way, I know it's a similar sort of thing. Of if you you got this religion, or you got this flat Earth belief system, and they got a warp reality to, to, to fit that model. The the thing that uh, you know, I, I, I talk about it. You know, they talk about you know, the sun and so forth, and, and and I happen to be one of those people that's actually measured the thing, right? Yeah, I've yeah. done the work um, twice. When you talk about measuring the distance of the moon, I've done that. Measuring the curvature, I've done that. And 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 it wasn't. And and this is part of science because science, science is about questions. Um, science values questions more than answers. If you get an answer, that's merely a stepping stone for more questions. Yeah. Scientists question. So why did I measure the distance of the sun? Because as a scientist, I must question. I must test. Why do people test general relativity? Why do people test quantum mechanics over and over again? It's not because they have doubt, right? It's not because their faith in blah, blah, blah. No, there's nothing to do with faith or belief. It's about questions. And, and, and the great scientists um, are the ones that ask the right questions of the right people at the right time. I mean, that was what they said about, about Erdős, a, a mathematician that I had the pleasure to interact with. And, and it was said, of among his many greatnesses is the ability to ask the right question to the right person at the right time. So these questionings, that, that, that early how far is the sun and why, um, set, myself, set myself up as a scientist. Now, religion very often, and, 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 and I also think conspiracy theory stuff, starts from we have the truth. And I'm going to mold my view of reality to, to fit that truth, as opposed to I have a question um, there. So I think this, this transition away from dogma, where you have answers, to questions, which were sciences, is, uh, was, was part of this transition. So um, I just then adopted the moniker, you know, your friendly secular astronomer. Yeah. Um, which is a little bit less threatening than saying, you know, I'm some some godless atheist, blah blah blah, blah thing. Um, I, you know, if someone asked me, well, you know, are you really a, an atheist? I have to sit there. First of all, I have to sit there and say, because there's all this uh, all this linguistic stuff and philosophy stuff, which I'm not an expert in, about what is technically an atheist and if you're soft or hard or agnostic, blah blah blah. So, so I uh, I just say, you know, I'm. Uh, I have no need for that hypothesis. Uh, the, the great, the supposedly the, what Laplace said to, uh, to um, it was Napoleon. There was a famous thing where, where uh, Laplace, an extremely uh, amazing scientist, was um, uh, several times in the presence of Napoleon talking about science stuff. And Napoleon asked, where is God in all this? And Laplace, in his, his ex the, 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 the fable said, he says, well, I don't have a need for God to explain things like Newtonian mechanics and orbits and so forth. I have no need for that hypothesis. He wasn't saying I reject it. He just says it's not necessary to have a God to explain physics. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people do uh, the whole 
you know, you can't have an infinite regress. And although I don't necessarily have an answer to an infinite regress, I I'm just I just say I don't know. But we still don't have evidence to suggest that there is this magical sky daddy. Yeah, that, that doesn't help anything. But you know, you know, you're you're saying I don't know is a very powerful statement. And to some people, a very dangerous statement, right? Yeah. Because so, so to, say, to say I don't know in part means, and I'm not going to accept, unquote, faith, your dogma, right? Yeah. I'm going to question, and that makes you a dangerous person. But, but, but that's, again, the essence of science which is asking questions. And, and, that, and, and by the way, one of the things that, that's very different from, sci from science versus, let's say, religion, or science versus some um, uh, conspiracy cult type thing, is that science gets really excited when they discover they don't know. Right? When, when dark energy and evidence for dark energy this, this, uh, became became uh, apparent, and it became apparent that we didn't understand um, what some, you know, 71 percent of the universe was, we got really excited. It was not a question, it was not a crisis of faith, it was not a, a conference we get together and try to reconstruct our dogma. It was, wow, we don't know, let's ask some questions, let's go and figure out what that is, because the beginning of knowledge starts from a question. Again, at 20 months old, I was a pseudo-flat earther, 20 months old. <laughs> but how did I cure myself of flat earthness? I asked questions. I began the quest to ask questions, and I didn't accept um, dogma uh, on, on that. Uh, that area. So, You know, it, it seems like from a lot of the conversations I've uh, listened to, that whenever you, whenever someone brings up evidence, or uh, whenever someone says something like, for example, uh, did did you see the the debate between Jaronism and Arn Ra? Yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of kind of uh, intense. So, I I sent in a question, uh, and I was talking about the uh, the tropic of. Cancer in the Tropic of Capricorn, yes, and how they take the same amount of time to to travel if you're going mm -hmm. at the same speed, mm -hmm. uh, and that wouldn't work on a flat Earth. And the the only thing that Jaronism uh, responded to that he he said that oh that's just you, you just believe that there's no evidence of that even though there are people that have traveled those. Yeah, <laughs> like like the same dude that has traveled all of them, including the equator. Uh, it, it, it seems that whenever you're talking to some of these people, that it even though they say that their minds can be changed, perhaps they can. Uh, but I'm not really sure exactly where to go because sure that because I'm, I'm not a mathematician, so I, I can't, like, take out a sheet of paper and just do all the math. Like, I can just talk about ideas, but the, the math I'm not so great at. <laughs> well, here's, you know, and, and someone who is in uh, to flat earthness, the thing that I would invite them to do is begin to do science. Um, reject what you've been given and start asking questions. So, so that might, that might, speak at least to the people that think there's a conspiracy to uh, yeah. around the earth and begin to ask questions and and see what the data lies don't cherry pick your facts to get a conclusion that again it, it it's the questioning that there so you're questioning about well what if i'm going to trot to tropics um what happens are very useful questions. Um, now, the other thing that happens when, when I encounter uh, flat earth is, you know, I am a person who is who's bipolar. By that meaning, I've been to the North Pole. I've <laughs> been to the South Pole. I've been to the South Pole more often than the North Pole uh, for, for lo logistical reasons. I've been to the Tropic. For example, a friend of mine went to the uh, Tropic of Cancer uh, and at at noon to do the vertical sun experiment and watch you know the shadows all go to zero and so forth you know but, and but i've done course, these sort of things but of course that can be explained by having a small sun that's very close <laughs> to the except of course that that violates the measurements we did of the distance of the sun 
And, and so these sort of things that I do um, as a matter of, 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 of course, you know, the reason I, I go to the South Pole is I'm looking for uh, meteorites, rocks from outer space that are embedded in the ice. We're looking for meteorites that um, fall all around the world, but when they fall in the middle of the Antarctic plain, they're sitting in pure water ice. They've been relatively uncontaminated by the biosphere, and those those chunks are about as, as, as close to uh, um, getting pieces of asteroid that you can get other than going to the actual asteroid and, and grabbing <laughs> a chunk, right? Um, and so I, I, I put up with the inconvenience of being in, in um, Kelvin-challenged environments. Yeah, Kelvin-challenged. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to do those sorts of things. And, and, but then while I'm there, um, I, of course, I have to go to the to the South Pole. And we're talking about the the rotational South Pole. I've been I've I've also been to the magnetic South Pole um, or flown through it because it's off the coast of Antarctica. I've been. Wait, to wait. The, uh, you said that there's there's a rotational South Pole and then a magnetic one. Yes, the magnetic field of the Earth is yeah. not in line with its rotational axis, right? The oh, magnetic it's, field it's is not, okay. the, 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 has to do with the domains of where they are and down inside the, the Earth. And by the way, there's lots of questions about how that, that process happens. Um, and, and, and geophysics is, is, has, some, has some models of how it's done, but, but we're learning more about how um, magnetic fields on planets work. But as I say, the, 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 the alignment of the domains of the magnetic field of, uh, that generates the dynamo inside Earth is not is not in line with the, with a, with a spin rotation. There's nothing that that makes the two have to have to um, align themselves. So when you see the compass, the compass is is being deflected by the magnetic field of the Earth. Mm. But the pole, the north pole, north magnetic pole, is actually off in Canada. It actually, is crossing the Antarctic or the Arctic Ocean heading towards Russia. The south pole, the magnetic pole, is is actually at about 137 degrees east longitude, and it's off now off the coast of um, Antarctica. So when you're at the you're at the spot where the sun where the Earth spins. I mean, if this is the Earth, and we're talking about the the, the rotational axis, the the south ge ge you know, geographic pole is the, the 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 if you will the pivot spot of the Earth. The the magnetic pole is off to the side. So when you're when you're standing on the uh, geographic South Pole, your compass points off along the longitude, you know, points south along that 137 degrees east. That's how you can orient yourself within the, the, the set. So, for example, I took a, um, one of my jobs when I go to the South Pole is to locate it within a centimeter, basically within about a thumb's width distance, right? Because um, people who come along our expeditions that pay good money, you know, to miss the pull by that much would be like a really stupid thing to do. So, so you, you know, I go to the point where I can put my thumb right down on the spot and say the, the South Pole is right there, right, at this yeah. time. Um, the ice moves, that's the major motion uh, there. The continent drifts and then the internal uh, uh, shifts in Earth, Earth's inertia also cause it to sort of move. So it's not in a, in a fixed spot each, each time. Right. Uh, so in that, that, now that we're talking about that, it makes sense to me how the, the magnetic reversal of the poles uh, works. And I know we're due for another one pretty soon, right? Because yeah. it's been a while. I mean, the assumption on, on there, we see from the um, ge geologic record of the, of, of, the, of the magnetic field flipping. That's not a physical earth turns over. Right. It's the domains inside the, the magnetic field that, that reorients itself. And for example, in the uh, Mid Atlantic Ridge, there's there's a spot where the where the plate is is cracking open. Um, you get a bunch of, of stripes, and as as like for example, um, as as magma comes up and cools, it, and and the thing is moving, um, it cracks and slowly spreads out. Well, along that line, you can stripe see stripes where the rocks are oriented this way. In magnetic field and that's way that have these flips occur and we can see scanning from the you know in symmetrical things going out the 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 and and and, and date those things we can see that that field flips um 
And, and the presumption is when you go into this magnetic flipping moment, um, the Earth's magnetic field will break down. You'll probably have multiple north and south poles of diminished strength while the, the thing reorients itself and builds to going south. Why it happens, the exact details of why it happens are, are subject to models. Um, I suspect if we experience such a thing, um, we'll gain a lot more data about it. But, the, but one of the assumptions is that while you're going through this period, you'll get a, basically a messed up magnetic field while it reorients itself. Um, so so what, what would you have to say to, to the naysayers that claim nobody has ever been to the South Pole? Uh, perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm you there. Might, I, I'm perhaps a frequent freak, freak visitor. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, um, and, and by the way, we, when you go there, we do the experiments to show, um, show that we're at the South Pole and, and do the location experiments. Again, that's part of the testing of, of where is it and, and why. Um, but in addition to that, we've done things like we've taken precision weights um, with our, on a precision scale where um, in Tokyo, this weight was um, 20.00001 grams, right? And it was a precision scale. And we brought it to the South Pole and did the weight, and it was 20.008 grams. Um, that extra weight was due to you know, there were factors. It was, in fact, you can calculate it. The centrifugal force, right? When you're on the um, equator, the, the spin of the Earth is basically, if you will, uh, in, in, in a naive way of thinking, you know, throwing out like the merry-go-round. You're at the edge of the merry-go-round yeah. on the flat Earth, throwing you out, right? On the round Earth, it's the bulge of the of of the equator. And when you're at the poles, you don't have that centrifugal force. You're sitting there just spinning around on on a point. You don't have the, the motion throwing off and, and that changes the weight of things. There's also a distance to the center of mass that you can also calculate because the earth is not a sphere like a like a, a, a bowling ball. It's called more more parachute. But but again the, as you see in the planets it's bulging out. The spin formation causes the planets to bulge out at the equator and flatten at the poles. Yeah. Um, it also, you see that from the point of view of air pressure. Um, the atmosphere at the equator is very thick because um, the, the, the Earth's atmosphere acting like a fluid bulges out and it flattens at the poles right, if you're spinning around centrifugal force. So even though you might be at, let's say, in feet, 10,000 feet physical elevation, you experience air pressures that are more on the order of 12 to 15,000 feet. Again, because of those those forces. So there's there's a number of things that that happen. Of course, the other delightful thing when you're below the Antarctic Circle and you're there in the summertime is the 24-hour sun. Or you can see the sun, you know, circum rotate around, um, and and a number of other factors that are there that are really cool that you can experience. Um, you know, it it's uh, it's a delight to go down there. It's also I must say it's a very emotional experience. As many times I've been there to the to the South Pole, I'm also, um, you know, there's there's this very emotional um, uh, experience of, of of arriving there and um, you know, being at a spot um, on Earth that, that is so special. But uh, people get really really annoyed at my at at the, you know me because you know I must be you know part of the conspiracy or the cult or whatever it is yeah you, you i'm must not quite sure what, what you get by 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 having a conspiracy about you know, round earth or slider that, that's never i've never figured out what it is so, i mean i can i can see experience of like you know have the monetary system controlling something but what do you out of uh out of faking the the shape of the earth i'm not quite sure so so this i actually <laughs> heard uh jaronism respond to this one uh he said that before, uh, like when everybody thought the earth was flat, it, it was all ruled by the church. And in order to break off from the church, uh, one of the components was apparently uh, demonstrating that the earth was in fact round. But now if science were to go back on that, they would have to go back to the church or something. And it's like, that's not how it would work. Because we, we saw the same... We saw a similar situation 
with a, a I, I don't know if it's George LeMay or George uh, LeMater, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but you know the the big the Bing Bang guy. He was trying to prove that the the universe had a, a beginning because he was a Catholic, and he was right about that. <laughs> but still, no God. <laughs> well, no God I mean, has been it, proven. And it's kind of interesting because because if you look into the history of religion, um, I think you would find in 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 Vatican records a combination of the Earth is flat, the Earth is round, and we don't care about the shape of the Earth. Right? There, there's been sort of three things you'll find there. Um, one of the things I've had the privilege of doing is going to the, the, the map room. The Vatican has an amazing collection of maps. And I, I love old maps. I'm talking about... And, and there are some very interesting round-earth old maps that the church is in possession of um, that are, that are quite, quite interesting. Also, um, there are... A, for example, there's a there's a museum in in uh, Tripoli, Libya. Uh, this is a time when you can go to Libya because uh, uh, we actually went there for a solar eclipse. As a planetary astronomer, I, I, a planetary scientist, um, I, I use solar eclipses to do experiments. So on the way there, we went by this this very important museum in in um, in Tripoli, and they have an amazing map, um, and in, and that the, the date is some circa. Uh, 900 um, um, AD E and and this map shows a two hemisphere. It's a two hemisphere projection. Um, they even show what what looks like bits of North America, uh, Japan, and so forth. There that is that that is a you know showing people who were doing this navigation and and part of the commentary talked about the fact that development of these kind of maps that are, while well, we would call it a crude map, from the point of view of geography, it was a fairly amazing collection of, of uh, representative of the Earth at the time. Uh, there, I explained that the need to pray towards Mecca and the development of the uh, astrolabe and the uh, development of navigation systems um, came from this edict that you've got to pray towards Mecca, right? Not where you think it might be on faith, but what, where it is. Yeah. Uh, is what the, I mean, so that, I'm, I'm not an Islamic scholar, but that's what this, this text was explaining. And that, that, um, that need to do that drove the, the, the skills for navigation and for um, you know, uh, saying survey techniques. Uh, and, and they have a number of instruments that people used to measure distances on the Earth and measure curvature and measure stuff, even back at, at, at that time. Yeah, like obviously one of the earliest ones was, I, I forget the dude's name, but you know, he had the two, uh, the two poles. Uh, is this like Aristophanes? Yeah, I think so. Is that so. his name? I, I, kind of, I apologize so, if that's so, not so, the right pronunciation of person. So, something like that. I forget his name. Uh, so that was like one of the first experiments, but of course, uh, flat earthers have their explanation for that. But it seems like even if they have an explanation for everything, their model doesn't fit together. It doesn't and, fit into a piece. Yeah, and, and just like religion, they're starting with a, with, with a, a statement of truth, and they warp the world so that that truth remains which yeah. is just as unscientific as possible. Start with questioning. I, I don't mind someone questioning how do we know the world is round, but take the next step of starting to do some of the experiments, right? And if you reject the, the so-called dogma of the round earth, go and do tests, but test it not to prove you're right, but to find out the answer. Again, the, the sign, ask questions is a very scientific process reinforcing dogma isn't, right? So, so I, I see kind of flat earth in the same way that people are trying to justify the Noah's flood, trying to justify various, various creation myths stuff, um, when in fact there's lots of amazing questions you can ask about uh, the cosmos. Um, and, and the lifelong, the nice thing is that you can have a lifelong experience of questions and, and working on those questions. Um, I, when I have discussions with people, one of the kind of things I hear is questions of the form, you know, do you believe in extraterrestrials? Do you believe 
in the Big Bang and so forth. And, and I, I end up rejecting the question because I, I think it's, 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 it's an improper scientific position to talk about what I believe. First of all, the cosmos doesn't give a damn what I believe, right? <laughs> The universe is what it is, whether I believe it or not. Right? Um, belief has nothing to do with how the universe actually is. Um, asking questions and, and, and doing experiments regarding those questions is a scientific process, but belief is, is not. So I reject these notions of, well, science is just another religion, right? I mean, science, I think, done right is, is again, questioning and would question someone who says, I know the truth. Um, it, it, I remember, you know, it, it was in, it, in my development on my approach to religion was also running up against scientific process where my advisor would say, you know, um, what you believe is irrelevant to what is. And your, and your theory you're trying to develop, your hypotheses that you're working on, do not tell the universe to do what it does. The universe is going to do what it does regardless of what your, your models might, might come up with. And that was something I had to learn because that was the, if you will, the dogma part of me, origin part of me, coming with truth and trying to warp reality around that truth. And it, it seems uh, that they, I mean, the loopholes that they have to jump through is just ridiculous. So I did, um, <laughs> I, I pulled up the Flat Earth website. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to uh, take a look at it if you're okay with sure, that. Sure. I wanna, sure. Yeah. I just want to go over some of these things. I'm going to try to figure out how to screen share on here. But very, uh, you know, as I'm talking about, you know, talking with some Flat Earthers. I think there's kind of, I put them into several, my model of flat earthness comes from, there's a group that is, is, um, tro are trolls, right? And um, I, I remember an encounter with people who were, uh, it was a group of physicists that were trolling other physicists with this flat earth model, but their reaction, rationale was, you know, don't assume the earth is round, prove it, right? Yeah. Um, and so that, I think there's, there's a question that are trolls or the group that says those are conspiracy, people who love to believe in conspiracies yeah. and, and that the round earth conspiracy and so forth is there. There's a third group, um, I think maybe all the other, you know, I would call the other, other section of people that are, that are either you know, uh, ignorant of, of modern processes or um, their religion tells them or whatever thing is. And there's probably some exceptions, but I think that seems to be the, the set. The trolls are people that are going to want to continue to troll no matter what you do. In fact, to try to prove, quote unquote, prove them, which is wrong way to go. I think it's, you know, ask questions of them. The trolls just delight because you're feeding the troll. The yeah. people that are in the conspiracy, when you get to the point of effectively challenging their belief, you become part of the them conspiracy. So the fact that I've been to the South Pole, the fact that I've made her the sun, I'm now part of the, you know, the, the people. Yeah, yeah. And then there's this third group, which perhaps you can explain by a failure of the educational system. Um, that's there. So let's, let's talk about some of the stuff. Um, Cause I think, I think as a scientist, it's worthwhile going through and doing the measurements. I encourage, scientists to, to, to do that rather than to simply accept as a article quote faith that the world is round you know yeah that, that and not even as uh, an article of, uh, of faith but if you actually want to, to know something you have you know the time and the resources and that it's something you're interested in you you can go do the research yourself uh, and if, if you're just throwing away every uh, every experiment we've ever done and instead taking uh, the word of other experiments that you know <laughs> that you already agree with uh then why not just do the experiment uh, yourself sure uh, i mean because if you're going to be if you're going to behave like let's say the young earth creationists and and reject any evidence that challenges your model and and cling to your dogma your faith 
then you know there's very little that rationality can do for you. Yeah. Uh, so the one of the, one of the f uh, first things on here, uh, and we were talking about it before. Do Do you see my screen? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I do. Okay. Uh, so just like on the frequently asked questions tab, uh, it says right here, people have been into space. How have they not discovered that the Earth is flat? And this is, uh, that's why I thought it was funny that you were talking about this before. The most commonly accepted explanation of this <laughs> is that the space agencies of the world are involved in a conspiracy faking space travel and exploration. This likely began during the Cold War's space race in which the USSR and USA were obsessed with beating each other into space to the point that each faked their accomplishments in an attempt to keep pace with the other supposed achievements. Um. <laughs> so one of the things that I also do that, that frustrates flat earthers is that in this notion of, of in planetary science, one of the things you need to do is to calculate orbits and to uh, develop a model about motions of objects. And a very important part of that, for example, the Earth environment is the moon. And where is the moon and how far is the moon? I'm not talking about, well, the moon's right over there. It's, it's measuring the distance to the moon. And the first, first time it was done to high precision was courtesy of the Apollo 11 astronauts. They left on the moon corner reflectors, basically these yeah. mirrors that have a, 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 um, uh, a, a, they have basically sort of looks like corners of a box. Um, when you're going down the highway and you see those reflecting dots uh, in, in the middle of the road or on, 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 on signposts, those are corner reflectors. And the property is that the light you send to them bounces straight back in the direction of travel. So we use the, um, the Shane telescope. It's a three meter telescope at Mount Hamilton, not just not very far, it's right, right over that direction. Um, and they, they have, a, uh, they have a, the, the time, uh, I think it's a 60 kilowatt laser uh, that's, that goes through the telescope where they pulse the laser light towards the moon. And if you're focused on the spot where the Apollo 11 landing occurred, um, the light will go out there, reach the moon, and bounce back. So what the telescope does, we use it. We use a, um, a particular frequency of, of laser light, and and we send the pulse and time it, and then and then watch for the return blip. So the light goes up there and back it's about a quarter, a second and a quarter, I believe, that to, to go to distance and a second and a quarter back. And that timing, that precise timing, allows you to measure the precision initially to the centimeter, um, but modern techniques now we can get it to the millimeter um, with other things about the clocks. But, but I'm somebody that actually has measured the distance to the moon. You can see the moon. We were able to, to measure the moon receding. We were also able to directly measure continental drift. So I have instruments that are watching North America creep over the, the, the crust of of there, we actually do direct measurements of this motion, um, and so, so the this was not possible until the Apollo and astronauts left the the corner reflectors on on the moon, and now we routinely bounce lasers off those things. There's other um, Apollo sites where those this uh, left, but the Apollo 11 was the first time that we had a direct measurement to the moon and a direct measurement of continental drift. Yeah, uh, speaking of the moon, uh, here, hopefully you can see the screen. Yes. Yeah, this is apparently how it works. Uh, and uh, if I, I just enlarge it here, but if I go back, uh, here is how it would look with all the different, uh, you know, you know, to explain the seasons, the, the sun would go, closer and further and apparently the moon would stay in the same orbit i guess and never meet except for when there's an eclipse <laughs> so uh, so the scientific process you would say is 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 would be here's a model and so we would then say all right with this model what would we expect to observe 
and how could we falsify it, right? So you go about trying to prove the model is false, and you then come up with an experiment to see whether the model survives. And the experiment fails, you discard the model and you try, try another one. Um, in that motion, for example, one of the things that, that, that you'd, you'd ask, and maybe it's just a simplistic thing about that diagram, uh, when you are below the Antarctic Circle in the summertime, when you were, for example, at the South Pole, uh, one of the things that's observed is the South Pole has one sunrise a year and one sunset a year. On the first day of spring, the, the sun rises at the South Pole. It stays up for six months and then sets on the first day of fall, where it then stays down for six months. So you have one six-month day and one six-month night at the South Pole. Same thing you get at the North Pole, but it's, but it's reversed. Uh, and yeah, and that, 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 that wouldn't really happen on, uh, <laughs> on a flat Earth if it's... Uh... If it's that, and, yeah, if it looks and, like and, that. And, and so you need to, uh, you need to ex your model needs to explain this phenomenon uh, there, and you, and you need to explain the circumpolar stuff. Now, I, I suspect there are, are more adjusted spots, but on that model, um, the, what I don't see is a south pole uh, there. I see a north pole, right. and I saw it acting as as if you're the first day of spring at the North Pole uh, but I don't see the the ability for either I don't I didn't see a South Pole and I didn't see the shift right because at for example, at the South Pole at the height of summer the the Sun is 23 and a half degrees above the horizon circumpolar and then the fall it's at the horizon the set and winter of course it's below uh, 23 degrees below so it, it moves back and forth on that that spot, and and I suspect there exist more wacky models to try to explain that uh, there, but but usually yes. they lack a yes. south pole. Uh, that's one one of the more interesting models I've seen to explain that was uh, that there were lands and more Earth beyond the uh, the flat Earth. Ah. Like there's there's more uh, you know left to be explored. When, when we went to see the, uh, observe the uh, 2015 total solar eclipse uh, near, uh, near at, the, at the North Pole, it was during almost at the time of the first day of spring when the sun was just beginning to rise at the North Pole. And it was nice to have a call while I was up there to my colleagues in the South Pole where they were, you know, it was the first day of spring, they were the first day of fall. So they were celebrating the sun setting and we were celebrating the, the sun rising. We had a, you know, a nice, a nice bipolar call during that time. Um, so you'd have to explain that phenomenon in your flat earth model of having a simultaneous conversation of two people uh, at the two different poles. Uh, by the way, also the other thing we've done at the South Pole is built a Foucault pendulum. Uh, uh, a what? A Foucault pendulum. Um, these are pendulums that basically the, the, the pendulum is, is oriented in a particular thing towards space, and as the Earth turns, the, the floor turns around underneath the Foucault pendulum. Oh, okay, okay. And usually what they do is they have to say, well, you know, like the Foucault pendulum in, in San Francisco, the first one was done at, in, in the expedition in Paris, and you have to deal with the, um, the latitude, so the, 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 the speed that, they, that the ground apparently turns under on the Foucault. So I think of the Foucault, Foucault pendulum maintaining the same orientation in space, and as Earth turns, that that pendulum has to continue, has to apparently move around on the ground, where it merely is just maintaining the same direction back and forth in space. Um, when you have a Foucault pendulum at the North Pole, the ground turns around exactly 24 hours. When you're to the South Pole, it turns around the opposite direction in 24 hours. And when, as you move from the pole towards the equator, the ground turns slower and slower to where if you're at the equator, the, 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 the ground doesn't move around at all because at, if this is the Earth, the pool pendulum is, is, is going, let's say, north-south orientation and, and during the day it never turns. So Foucault pendulums don't turn at the equator. At the, 
So they're basically you will uh, infinitely slow turning around or they're at the, at the poles. It's a one day and it has to do with a, the tangent of the of the longitude. But it's a nice experiment to show that at the south pole the, the Earth is turning backwards because it's you're you're underneath. These are sort of experiments you do because it's part of science and it's fun. Yeah. Speaking of also stuff that is part of science and is fun, uh, gravity. <laughs> yes. So gravity is amazing, I think. I think uh, so. It, 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 as you say, it, it sucks in a good way. Yeah. Uh, and there is this very interesting uh, piece here on the Flat Earth site. Hmm. Uh, so let's see. Why doesn't gravity pull the Earth into a spherical shape? And then this is where it gets good. The Earth isn't pulled into a sphere because the force known as gravity exists in a generally diminished form compared to what is commonly taught. The Earth is constantly accelerating up at a rate of, and first of all, you wouldn't even have an up without gravity anyways. Uh, the Earth is constantly accelerating up at a rate of 32 feet per second squared, 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, the constant acceleration causes what you think of as gravity. Uh, imagine sitting in a car that never stops speeding up. You will forever, uh, you will be forever pushed into your seat. The Earth works much the same way. It is constantly accelerating upward, being pushed by a, and this is where I think it gets amazing, universal accelerator known as dark energy or etheric wind. First of all, we disproved <laughs> the ether like fucking <laughs> decades ago, uh, and. <laughs> I, I I just love how they decided to throw dark energy in there. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, here again, you said so. So if you convert this to a scientific process, you would say, um, how how would we test a model that gravity is an effect of a disk, you know, accelerating upwards, right? And so you would then ask predictions this model would make, and you test those predictions. And, and go about seeing where the model survives, right? You don't start from truth and, and then justify and rationalize. That's, that's a very unscientific, that's what religion will do. Um, and so the flat earth religion um, says, well, here's an explanation. They try to rationalize it just like here's the flood or here's a six day creation thing. So what I would encourage scientific process is to say, well, let's go out and test that. Let's test that model to see whether or not gravity is merely an outward acceleration. And by the way, there are uh, round earth people that, that say that what's happening is the earth is expanding at the rate of, of, of G, right? And, and the I earth feel is, like that would be more noticeable. Up <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, and of course, that would cause distances in to, 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 to expand on the thing, and so you'd, you'd, you'd fail. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the things that, that is very, um, in terms of, there's lots of various things, various measurements you can make regarding um, gravity, but one of the things you'd have to explain is the, the effect of a, a weight at the equator being different than a weight at the pole. So you'd have to have something to explain that set. A, a simple, it's a pancake moving upward and accelerating for whatever reason, um, would, would have a uniform weight across the, the disk and you don't see that. Yeah, and that's, that's, that is really uh, interesting because I, I didn't even ever think about that. Uh, although what I think is a good thing uh, to always bring up is the whole sinking ship. Uh, sure. Now, uh, this you know this surprisingly doesn't come up in as many conversations with flat earthers as you'd think. Uh, but on their website, under the section experimental evidence, um, let's read this under sinking ship effect. It is proven that the ship does not sink behind a hill of water but that it is actually perspective which hides it. This demonstrates that the Earth is not a globe. <laughs> there have been experiments where half-sunken ships have been restored by simply looking at them through telescopes, showing that they are not actually hiding behind hills of water. Uh, so, 
obviously we have to take into account uh is it ref refraction right or yeah. the yeah yeah and 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 so one of the things you can do is be in a spot where you can move up and down let's say in a lighthouse looking out at let's say an oil derrick which is not moving right because they'll they'll to try to minimize and you can see that effect happening another thing that 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 is done and it's a really good way to measure the curvature of the earth is to watch sunset at a um at a at a, at a lighthouse on on the coast so you have the sun setting on on a, on a clean horizon there's no bumps there it's, it's it's an ocean and you will you observe the difference in sunset time between the the, the top of the tower and the bottom of the tower now you can either go there and see the, the light move down, or you can have someone at the tower saying, the sun set, and you can stand there at the, uh, at, at the base of the tower and wait until the sun sets for you. And you can use that time difference um, and measure the height of the tower to then get an approximation of the um, curvature of the Earth, which you can do um, on the sand with some simple calculations. Right? You don't even have to have a, a, a calculator. You can do some sets. And I've, I've done that, for example, with my nieces and nephews, where we've, we've calculated and estimated the, the curvature of the Earth using the difference in sunset between at the bottom, where you have a local tangent, at the top, where you're seeing a tangent farther, you know, farther down the curvature of the Earth. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, of course, is, is going up in high altitude. Um, I had a privilege um, and as a, you know, of, of riding in, a, in an F-18, F and they were doing it for, for various people to fly around uh, in, in, in the Bay Area. And having, you know, my father been a private pilot, I'd been in planes and flying around. I said, I want to go up. And so we did this, let's do this ballistic, you know, I don't try it around. I want to go up high. And so the thing took off from Moffat and just, you know, full afterburners. And we had practiced my holding in the stuff because when you accelerate, um, the, the G-forces move your blood and you have to sort of work really hard to keep from blacking out uh, there. But I managed to do that. And one of the things we went, you know, it went as far as possible. You know, the engines cut out. We went through this beautiful ballistic arc. And one of the things at the top was to go and look and, and see the curvature. Now, we were, we were not um, very high as far as outer, we weren't in outer space, but we were, we were, I think, if I recall correctly, somewhere around, I think, 65,000 feet elevation. I mean, how, I'm, I mean, I'm how, doing how the meters. Does, how high does a normal plane go? I have no idea. I mean, it's normal, normal aircraft. Uh, commercial aircraft fly in in feet. It's somewhere between about thirty five thousand and maybe forty two thousand okay. feet. Um, I've been in like a Gulf Stream five. That's been that they seem to do high altitude sets. Um, but this was a this was this was this was going through the ceiling of a plane. The plane doesn't operate at that point. Basically, the plane was acting like a rocket, and and the engines basically cut out when it because it's basically just full throttle. Uh, as much thrust as possible, arced and did a beautiful arc. And then we went through this sort of, you know, the ballistic arc of kind of the zero G thing. So I had like a, a pin that floated while we were doing the set. It was, it was, it was, it was great fun. And um, one of the experiments I did while I was up in the arc was to try and, and a major curvature. And you can see at that point, uh, it's not as good as if you were like in the space shuttle where it's like really obvious curvature but the time it was there. The other thing I was looking for was be able to see st stars. And so prior to this thing, I dark adapted my eyes. So I had on, from the beginning of the day, these dark, dark you know, red goggles um, and, and kept my eyes closed during the launch going up and then pulled off. So I had dark adapted eyes so I could begin to see. You know, and, I, and I knew, for example, where Sirius was uh, I knew where Jupiter was. I, I had a direction, and, and I was able to perceive Saturn, um, you know, in in the daytime, avoiding the sun, right? Because that was part of the thing we turned it so they didn't, they wasn't blinded by the sun there. But but seeing the curvature, and you can see the dense atmosphere to less less dense atmosphere above you uh, was also a, a, a joy. But as I say, those are those are things that the uh, I think the flat earthers have have problems explaining 
yeah, when they, they cling to their dogma, right? When they cling to their flat earth religion, um, these sort of evidences kind of annoy them, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's important uh, because I feel like flat earthers might get mad. Uh, they, because it itself is not part of any religion. Uh, oh, okay. And, yeah, they, they point uh, that you're out. Right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Maybe uh, I should say the, the flat earth behavior that appears to behave it, like a uh, dogmatic it, religion. It, I, I mean, it's, it it's definitely dogma, but it's just not religious dogma. It's still dogma. Oh, okay, I, 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 I sit corrected. It's not a dogma. And I apologize for equating of religion. I'll, I'll use dogma instead. Yeah. But, but this notion of the, of, of the curvature and effects of the curvature um, I've heard, you know, rationalization about air pressure and, and refraction yeah. <laughs> and perception and so forth, but it, 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 it doesn't explain the difference in, you know, watching a mountain and sunrise, you know, uh, occurring in a mountain um, at a different time than when you're down in the valley, right? You can see that, 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 that difference and that, that change in, in horizon um, equates with a curvature of, of the Earth, sometimes I've heard flat Earth models where they have a disc, but the disc is slightly arced. Right? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a quasi flat. Thing. It's a it's a compromise. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but other things that that you would, I mean, again, I think as a scientist you should question and then design experiments to try that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I remember when I was uh, like in high school. When we were talking about you know demonstrating the curvature of the Earth, um, just kind of a throwaway thing was if you kind of like how are you talking about with the with the lighthouse? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you just go uh, onto the beach, just like lay flat on your uh, stomach, wait for the uh, sun to go down, and then you hop mm -hmm. up and then watch it set again. Yes, and yeah. that 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 motion. Of six feet is not as good as having someone, let's say, go to a lighthouse and have someone at the top, yeah, um, yeah. on a phone saying the sun sets for me now, and then, and you're at the bottom and you measure yeah. the time difference. And um, actually, with the with the with the Burj Khalifa uh, in Dubai, mm -hmm. the Ramadan actually starts at a different time. Yes, for like the the top. Or like any any floor over eighty or, or something, because yeah. of the time difference. And you know, uh, and, and also in terms of you know the, their their call to prayer at noon time, when we observed the total solar eclipse in the Sahara Desert in two thousand six, um, we could have gone to the spot where the eclipse occurred at solar noon. Um, that would have given us the maximal eclipse uh, time. But the people we were with would have been in the process of doing their noon prayers. Mm. And um, so as a courtesy, we moved to a different spot where the eclipse occurred, uh, I think, 10 minutes after uh, uh, solar noon. So they did their, their, solar, their noontime prayers, watched the total eclipse, solar eclipse, and then... Um, but there was a, actually a debate of two imams. Uh, apparently, in Islam, uh, the the there's a there's a the story about Muhammad seeing a solar eclipse. They actually um, witnessing it, and, and they had they had known the solar eclipse was coming. And and there's various things about about what happened there. Uh, I, I if I recall correctly, they were explaining that he like he had a child that died and was sad, and then saw the solar eclipse, and it was this miracle miracle of Allah. And so the debate on Imam was, what should you do during its total solar eclipse? Should you be praying to Allah, or should you watch it and then pray? And the one Imam said, well, this is a holy time where, like the prophet who prayed, you can, you know, your, your prayers will be specially marked or whatever thing is. Um, the other side said, no, 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 no. This is a miracle of Allah, and if you waste time praying, you ignore the miracle and you insult Allah. So you watch the eclipse and then you pray. And they had this long, long debate in the night over that. And it ended up being that some people prayed during the eclipse and didn't see it. Other people watched the eclipse and then prayed. Um, it was a fascinating little, you know, uh, angels and heads of pin discussion.
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I always find those super interesting. Like, what I really... I really want to see two people I really disagree with go <laughs> at it on some topic. Uh, like, if I were to watch, like, Kent Hovind and Jaronism, <laughs> yeah. I would be uh, like... You know, it was, it was amazing, crazy. but we were, we, we were with the Tuareg, which are the, the desert people of... Uh, desert people in, um, in, this, in, in the Sahara. Some people confuse them with a with a Bedouin, right? They're they're mm-hmm. Arabian Peninsula. These are the Tuareg people that that move across on on the on the desert there. Uh, we had a, a experience to talk to a, a, a gentleman, a, one of the elders uh, in the region, um, who had seen a previous total solar eclipse at the same spot, and we knew from from the patterns the the and and he was a very old person, and we knew that he had to be at least 104 years old. Um, very ancient gentleman, and he was the man who um, had the, the the knowledge of of his of his people, and it was said this man could speak for six whole days to tell the tale all the stuff of, of his memories from 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 his experience. But again, it was a a small thing of confirmation because you know he saw the eclipse. And then, you know, and, and he said it, it was like the one he saw in his childhood. Um, he, I guess he was of the, of the form of you watch the eclipse and then you pray. We had taken an image and, and with a local, local printer, we had gone back to Tripoli and back in to, to print it. And one of the gifts we gave him was of uh, a telescopic image of the corona. And we presented to them, it was not just simply you just gave him as a gift, you had to ask his sons for permission to present a gift to him because it's a protocol if you didn't want to create an obligation. So the negotiation of can we give this guy this gift, um, and he saw the thing and he started questioning because he said that's not what it looked like. Um, he saw it uh, closer to solar n- closer to solar noon. We saw it, you know, actually it was slightly before solar noon. So we saw it some 25 minutes later. And he had a visual acuity to know because the solar sun's corona is is changing, and so he saw it slightly different. And we had that explanation of why our image of the sun was different than what he saw. But once he was comfortable with it, he accepted it. And and then the then what started was an interesting cultural process where people started bidding for the 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 gift. And apparently, this is a thing to do when you give the chieftain a gift. People around them begin to establish its value um, by bidding for it to try to to try to buy it from the person. That's interesting. And and this thing helps establish the importance of the of the receiver of the gift. This 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 sort of tribal elder. Um, the higher the the bids, the more uh, the, you know, the 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 higher status was is is of the receiver. Um, but at some point. He he stopped the the whole bidding and, and gave this big cross speech to people that were sort of sheepish. And his bid his thing was this is a miracle. Um, and he but he said we know it's a miracle. We know it's going to happen, but still a miracle. And you don't bid on miracles, right? This is and he put it up on the mantle of his tent, saying this is for everyone. Um, this is a miracle. And and I, I appreciate that notion because if you've ever seen a real total solar eclipse. It is an amazing experience. So his notion of that it's a miracle, even though they understand why. I mean, there were people there that could talk about Earth, Sun, or in Lion, and they could they can give you explanation of how a total solar eclipse occurs. And by the way, they drew round things, right? They didn't drive flat things. <laughs> um, and and the moon. It's actually funny that 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 the moon. Why is the moon, the sun, a round disk, but the Earth is this flat thing? Um, yeah, Why? And yes. It, it 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 seems like <laughs> this this entire their their model wouldn't work like in any way because so when it comes to because there there are those people that think the sun and the moon are simply holograms uh, ah. or they're th- not holograms they're just projections they're like uh, you have the celestial sphere and they're just lights uh, shining right through it um, and that's very interesting because one goes in front of another yes. <laughs> and not just in front of it you can you can distinguish it because of uh effects like uh bailey's beads sure like that so there's clearly an object there 
But then yeah. even in that model, when you're talking about, you know, the sun moving in and out, uh, like from the from the pole to the edge, I guess. Yes, yes. Uh, and the moon is staying pretty much in the same uh, in the same orbital location, uh, or rotational location. And how would eclipses work in that situation? Because sure. one's getting further away from the other, and you wouldn't, like, it would only work for, like, people further, oh, uh, wait, hold on. Well, it, it wouldn't work for the same uh, people. It wouldn't work for everybody. Yes. And, and of course, at lunar eclipses, when you see the shadow the Earth casts and the moon goes into that shadow, you always see a, a, an arc. You never see a line go across if, if the Earth was on its side, if there was like this thin, thin pancake thing. The other thing about the, the round sun is we have a, a spacecraft called Stereo. Um, there was well, stereo A and B, but, but one of them the crafts failed. And they're sort of behind, they're, they're, they're able to see, they're in Earth's orbit, but they're, be, they're behind the sun. And so we can, from that projection, see an eruption of the sun and see the sun rotate, and that eruption um, then appears uh, from Earth's perspective. Uh, is, is, is one of the things. And of course, on the telescopes, uh, we can see the other planets as nice round disks. So, so Mercury, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, Pluto is also a planet, but you have to have a really big telescope or close to it to be able to see it. So the, the big planets um, are, are big enough you can see disks. So why, do, why is the Sun, the Moon, and the big planets all disks? Um, but of course, you can see them rotate. You can see, you know, Jupiter rotates once every, it's around nine and a half hours um, or so. It spins fast enough that at the beginning of the night, you can see where, the, where, where Jupiter is and you can see turn appreciably on its axis, right? So why is the, why does Jupiter spin around? Um, but Earth is somehow a flat disk. I mean, <laughs> why was the Earth special unless it's the elephants on top of the turtle um or that's discworld i'm sorry I, I'm <laughs> my myth uh it's um, it's it's all super uh fascinating because they they can't really agree on it because it depends on uh in some instances their theology uh yes or their their, their dogma right it's not consistent but again i i encourage questioning but but then do it in a scientific process of, of develop a hypothesis, develop a model, test the model, and if the model fails the test, reject it and find something else. Right? That's, that's yeah, the, yeah. That would be what I would encourage you to do. Yeah. I, and we need to find uh, models that also, uh, they, they need to have explanatory power, and they need to have predictive capability, they need to be falsifiable, yep. uh, and uh, I think that they shouldn't violate Occam's razor, so we yes. shouldn't assume too much. Yes, and and and, and a simpler explanation uh, would be would be better, and but not too simple, right? That's the, the that's the thing. So um, I, for example, had when I uh, I had uh, surgery to correct a heart valve, and my, the anesthesiologist that came in to to there because I'm known as the astronomer guy even in the hospital was he he wanted to have a conversation give me the cocktail and have this conversation and to the point where i stopped responding they knew then to go into the operating room so he started off by saying um i've heard people believe that the moon is hollow so how would you go about proving the moon was hollow or not hollow what would you do and so we had this nice explanation of the experiments you could design to try to infer whether the moon was solid or hollow and uh, that ended up lasting for about a half hour to the point where the surgeon waiting in the surgery room says, where is the patient? And uh, <laughs> he calls up the, the anesthesiologist and says, well, he's still talking. So he said, give me another, give me another, um, uh, give him another dose. So apparently they gave me a second dose. And then the, 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 the assistant anesthesiologist says, I understand you're a mathematician, you're involved in prime numbers. And we had a discussion about prime numbers. I went into the surgery room while they're waiting for the second dose. They, they, they doubled the dosage to knock me out. And we had another, I'm supposedly nearly 40 minute discussion about primality. 
to which point the frustrated surgeons had given him a third dose. The third dose, by the way, ended up causing a memory lapse between the, the, the second dose and the third dose. So by the way, there were some experiments we were making along the line of going an, under anesthesiology. One of the things was that the anesthesiologist was going to place somewhere in the operating room on a piece of paper a number between three and five digits, face up, but I couldn't see on, on the gurney. And I was going to try to have an out-of-body experience to see if I can see that number, right? And of course, I failed to to um, to experience it. It was I was also very interested about the the warp because there's a difference between loss of memory and being in an anesthesia. So the effect was, you know, I had memory. I had memory of time passing between the second and third dose. Where the third dose, I was I was out. I went out there, and and at that point, I had no no concept of space or time because there was then an instant it, for me the perception was instantly being teleported back to the recovery room um, and that was a case where I knew my job was find the button and press it to let them know you're coming out of consciousness and the second thing was begin to do calculations because I would have tubes everywhere, in my nose, in my mouth, stuff on my ears, stuff in my chest. I had these little battery cables because I could restart the heart so forth. I had, I had, yes, I had things in those other nether regions <laughs> as well. Um, and, and I knew that, that you press the button so they would give me the pain-killing drugs as the anesthesia is wearing off and then work on mental problems to not freak out about having all this stuff in you. And so I was doing cubic equations, but, but, but also try to remember as much as I could about the, the event. But it was really weird to sort of like be blip, right, from, from one state to another state um, instantly. And, and you know, it's sort of what I think about what probably happens in death, uh, as well as similarly to what happens um, pre-birth, which is essentially there's no concept of, of space or time. You basically are, are completely out of it. Um, so it was, a, it was an opportunity to do experiments, right? It was fun. Okay. Yeah, that, that does sound fun. Now, you, you brought up uh, prime numbers there. Yeah. And from what I know about your professional work, you do a lot with prime numbers. <laughs> yeah. So yes. it, I, I, like I said, not a mathematician. I don't even understand it a little bit. Uh, like, I mean, I get basic math. I'm not saying that I don't understand basic math. <laughs> um, and I've... I've been trying to learn uh, calculus, uh, mm -hmm. but what? So, what is it exactly that you found out? Because I know you got awards for it, right? Well, um, so so a prime number is a is is a whole number greater than one, right. whose only factors are one in itself, right? yeah. and we exclude one for for various reasons uh, as, as prime. So, two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, so forth are. Are examples of primes because they have they have no other factors other than one in themselves. Um, but but primality is a property of numbers that that's one of the a aspects of them being prime is they are not divisible by other numbers. The other thing is that that every every number every whole number um, you know greater you know, greater than one is a is a prime or a product of primes. Uh, the fundamental theorem of, arith of arithmetic. But there are many properties that primes have other than simply you can't divide them by anything other than one of themselves. And the way that people um, prove extremely large numbers being prime is not by exhaustively factoring. The, 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 you, the, there's not enough time and computer power in the universe to do things of that, of that nature, even if you have quantum computing and whatnot. Uh, that what they do is they say here this number has a property that only prime numbers have therefore it's prime is how so the you know there's a whole big work on how do you break a number factor it break it down into its pr uh, product of primes and there's another whole body around how do you prove the number is prime they only intersect in the in a very narrow thing which is the exhaustive search for 
four factors and failing to find one. Um, but that exhaustion doesn't work if the number is even respectively in size, let alone industrial strength primes, let alone approaching the largest known prime. So when people um, discover a new largest known prime, they use a computer to construct a proof that that number has a property that only prime numbers have, and therefore it's prime. Um, they don't do it by exhaustive uh, uh, factoring. And so what it, to, to find a largest known prime, you have to um, uh, instruct a computer to carry out calculations that construct a proof. Um, the problem is that those calculations, even for computers, are ex enormous. And so you have to be very efficient in how you do your calculation. The other problem is that it takes computers, even the biggest computers, a long time to do these calculations, often longer than their mean time of error. Computers are imperfect. They, they, they're machines. They have, they have electronic errors. There are cosmic rays. There's decay of radioactive particles inside chips and so forth that can cause calculation errors. So you have to build a very robust calculation method to detect the errors and retry them or recover from them. And so a lot of the, the value in searching for a large prime is not in the answer, but in the question. Again, this is the scientific method. And the techniques you do to, to um, do error correction helps improve in calculation correctness. The, the techniques you develop um, in doing the calculations rapidly are techniques that also help in doing things like seismic analysis in, in, in Fourier analysis, a number of, of scientific processes and industrial processes that benefit from the techniques you develop. So the actual number itself you find is kind of a nice thing, but it's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't really have any mathematical value. What's valuable is the question and the methods you use. Um, so, to, so is that what you do? Are you, do you try to figure out a new method? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, and and there's there's been also this notion of of getting people to cooperate on large problems, and um, I'm involved um, there with a, with a thing called the Electronic Frontier Foundation has something called the Cooperative Computing Award, and I, I helped develop this this set of of a, a series of awards for people to discover very large primes. And so, for example, the, the, the award that's, one of the, the next award that's outstanding is $150,000 to the first person to prove a number with um, 100 million or more decimal digits in size, right? Right now, the numbers are somewhere in the, I think, in the 25 million range. So it takes a while for them to get up to the ability. And by the way, they're not testing every prime. They're trying to find numbers up there to see if they can do the calculations to find 100 million. So it's $150,000 effectively for the first 100 million or more digit prime. And then there is a $250,000 award for the first billion decimal digits or more uh, prime. And you have to prove it and you have to publish your proof, right? So it's not a matter of saying, I think this number is prime. You actually have to publish it in a peer-reviewed journal. You have to go through the, if you will, the scientific or mathematical process of, of establishing a proof and establishing the credibility of your claim before you can claim the, the award. But I, so I'm involved in that, and then I also do public outreach on my site. I can give you a link. There's a um, there's a link to a, um, a tutorial I give, which is the current modern techniques you do for being able to find a new largest known prime. Uh, and it's something that people can, 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 can work on. Uh, it's, it's something I would encourage, because again, the pursuit and the techniques are, um, are, quite, are quite valuable. And again, it's, it's the answer you get is less interesting than the method and the questions you asked. Right. So I put a link up there as, as well for, that's the link for the tutorial. And we keep it updated mm -hmm. as new techniques come forward. Uh, we, we add, we update the, the set. Um, I should mention by previously, uh, we were talking about measuring the, the distance to the sun. And, and so I'll put a link up there. You can, 
put this in show notes, if you will. Yeah, this, yeah, is, this is the link on on the transit of Venus and my measuring the distance to the sun. Sure. Um, yeah, but but again, it's 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 numbers are fascinating. The math is is a uh, is mathematics is a language that we use to convey very complex um, concepts that the English language or other languages, other natural languages are less precise where mathematics allows you to make precise, more precise statements, yeah. um, which is useful in, in asking questions. And precise questions are hard to answer. And I've been, uh, I've been meaning to ask you this for most of the show. So behind you, is that uh, a, an actual board or is that just the wall that you're writing well, on? We have, we have in our lab these, these walls that, that, are, that are basically whiteboards. Okay. Okay. So it's both. It's right. with the table, so forth. Because, because you know, you don't ever know when inspiration will strike. Yeah, so you have good. to be able to do things here with, with 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 stuff. It's a, it's a thing. I mean, if you if you were to you know look out here, you would see again more whiteboards with calculations <laughs> and people and all kinds of stuff out there for for stuff. It's and 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 this kind of symbol stuff here is a way of expressing things. That language, natural language like English, is imprecise on, and so this is actually this is a big about. I was explaining something about primality proofs, so um, that's what that bit is about. Um, but it's, again, the, the mathematics is a tool that scientists use to ask questions, uh, and again, one of the problems that that dogma sometimes runs into is the questions they ask are imprecise or, or they're not really answerable. So a question about do you believe in extraterrestrials is not a good question. Um, you know, a better question, and that's, you know, I, I, it's one of the things, I'm, I'm in a taxi and the taxi cab driver says, what do you do? I'm an astronomer, planetary scientist, and one of the inevitable things is do you believe in extraterrestrials? And I try to avoid asking, answering that question because do you believe is not really in congruous with the scientific process. And so I say, well, perhaps a, a better question is, you know, you know is, is there a high likelihood of life outside the Earth, right? Somewhere else in the universe. Is that a probable thing? What does the data that we that we've observed in the universe suggest about the possibility of life outside of Earth? To that question, I would answer. I would find it incredible if we we're the only life in the in the universe. Yeah, that um, would that that would be uh, a shock because because you're left with a. I mean, it's called the frame paradox, but I don't really see how it's a paradox. It's just the question, because ah. it's because it's like uh, okay, so either we are in fact the only life in the universe, and that's really weird. Uh, and but I, I, I explain I can explain the, the Fermi paradox um, there. Although I never met Enrico Fermi die before I did. Uh, it was uh, Feynman that explained to me the the thing about said said imagine. You're you're a you're a you're a civilization that's intelligent enough to have spacecraft go out and send out space probes, and what you do is your space probe goes out and finds a planet, lands on that planet, uses the planet's resources to construct more of your spacecraft, and send them out. Right. So we send out a a, a probe. It lands on Mars. That Mars planet uses robots to build probes and send them out. And it goes farther and farther. But let's say you can, and you you can even take, you know, the hundred thousand years to to go long distance to stars and begin to to go on those planets. You can show, even with those long distances, that in a relatively short time on the cosmic scale, um, you know, as you're doubling each time. So let's say what happens is your probe builds two probes and they go out to find planets. And there's a reasonable chance that those things. Um, you, and some, some probes die along the way, but let's assume that, that you have some exponential growth of probes. You can show that in very short order, your, in terms of number of generations, you have explored most of the, um, the galaxy. 
And, and, and so Theramis said, this is a real thing for civilization to do, send out probes and have those probes multiply. And in and fact, if that's been done in the, in the, it, it, somewhere in our galaxy, then our galaxy should be, should be already full of probes. So okay. Theramis said, where are the probes? Gotcha, okay. His where are they is where are this, where is this exponentially increasing set of probes going out there? And it's one thing I think that, that, the Earth, that, that Earth should do is build, in, in, in exploring the universe, we've got to develop probes that are independent of Earth. Every time we send up humans, they've been on a ship that requires either constant resupply from Earth or they have enough thing to not you know, run out of, of water and, 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 and air and, and food like the, 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 the missions to, to the moon. Um, what we've got to be able to do is to develop probes that can operate independently of that. So one of the efforts is to build a terrarium. Like take a simple ecosystem of some mosses, some bugs, some bacteria and other things, build in that like, like you have on, on, you know, on, might you have on your desk. And let's say this terrarium operates you know, out at the same Earth-sized distance, let's say either ahead or behind of Earth. And this thing, you know, build, it, build it small enough that it basically can be self-sustaining and just keep going. It doesn't require you to keep adding stuff. It's got a, it's, and you need to know, understand ecosystems. You need to understand life cycles. That's the beginning of building a spacecraft that can be multi-generational where people can, can use their own ecosystem and not keep coming back and forth to Earth, where if you want to send something to Alpha Centauri that, that's going to take many, many generations to get there, um, build your own ecosystem that where it's self-contained and, it can, and it, can, it can perpetuate itself, and then have those things land and continue going forward. The Faraday paradox says, if there's life in this galaxy, that's done this, where are they? That's the fairy paradox. Right, that, that, that makes sense. Uh, so, we, speaking... Go ahead. Okay. No, no, go, go on. <laughs> I was talking about exoplanets, which was part of my, my t-shirt, you know, our, our, our other solar system. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's happened in the last, I'd say, 25 years or so is our knowledge about just how many planets there are. Um, it... It, in, or in the early days in childhood, planets were special, right? There were the planets we knew in our solar system, and that was it. It was very difficult. Yeah, uh, it was very difficult to find Pluto. planets around. Yes, and <laughs> and um, and why? You know, Pluto is a dwarf planet. Right, right, dwarf right. Dwarf is a type of planet. Yeah. So, so those that rip, ask, those, rip, those Pluto deniers, <laughs> as as you know, uh, as Tice and I have have, have had a, a chance to good nature are you know argue over <laughs> over that. Uh, those Pluto deniers, you know, they're kind of cute, but but anyway, um, uh, we we have had a, a really amazing explosion of of planet discoveries, right? We we know right now we're talking about planets that have been doubly confirmed. Um, uh, is right now the count is uh, three thousand seven hundred and sixty five. Uh, planets. I will give you a link in the show notes. There's a spot here, and this is a catalog. Um, it's exoplanet.eu. It's the catalog of when a planet is discovered and confirmed by an independent process. It goes into this catalog of where it is and properties and so forth. So we are looking at a larger and larger volume of space that is, um, you know, where we've been discovering uh, planets. When able to discover smaller and smaller planets. So this database is kind of biased by the obvious planets near, nearby, the big ones. But as we are technically getting better, we're getting smaller and smaller planets. Given the volume of space now that we've explored, um, we, have, we know now that there are more planets than stars. So in our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy, our, our little island in the, in the universe, that has somewhere around 200 billion stars. There are, based upon our, our measurement of our, our volume around our, uh, our star, um, there are at least a trillion planets. 
that about 70% of single stars have planets around them, multiple planets, and surprising about 30% of binary stars and multiple star groups have planets orbiting them as well. That came as a surprise because it was originally hypothesized that only single stars could have planets, um, but, but the universe um, uh, has, has different. So you can go to this thing and you can watch the count increase. There is a, uh, launched a, on, um, on, a, on a rocket, a, a new uh, planet finder. And so we're going to be going up. Well, the, the James Webb telescope, when it launches, will also give us greater capabilities. But that's the exciting thing is planets went from the rare things that we only know in our solar system to they're common to they're more common than stars. That that majority of planets are rocky planets, not Jupiter gas bags. Why? Because we, we hypothesize that it's much easier for interesting chemistry to evolve on a rock surface than within a gas cloud. Um, there are, of course, a number of planets that are in zones where interesting chemistry can occur. This, this Goldilocks zone is not a, you know, uh, the zone where you, you don't need a jacket outside. It's, it's when it's too close to the star, the temperature is too high, you get plasma, and the chemistry is, goes off the charts. On the other side of the coin, it's too far from the star, it's cryogenic, and the chemistry is too slow to non-existent. So you need somewhere in the middle for interesting chemistry to occur, right. to have what's called evolution, where there's imperfect chemical replication and stuff begins to, 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 to drift around and do interesting things, given enough time. The other thing, of course, you need a planet that's, that's, around, that's in a stable orbit. If it's going between hot and cold, hot and cold, no. um, you know, it's not going to do well chemically. You also need a star that's relatively stable. There are stars that are cataclysmic and, and, and occasionally blast their, their surroundings with radiation. So you want to, but fortunately, there's a whole big majority chunk of stars that are relatively stable. There are all things that are relatively stable orbits. And so we're building up a, a catalog of probable planets. We find, in fact, the majority of rocky planets, in fact, it turns out the majority of planets appear to be dwarf planets like Pluto. Earth being big seems to be sort of the oddball exception, not a rare one, but, but if you talk about in terms of planet counts, there are more things like Pluto than there are like Earth. Um, but still, there's plenty of Earths. So yeah. that trillion planets in our galaxy is probably a lower bound. There are plenty of planets that are also free-floating as well, but around stars where you have where we have energy uh, to 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 keep the 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 you know the, the chemical systems going, supplying energy, there are plenty of combinations for um, systems, even just like Earth. There may be other systems of life that are not like Earth that are out there, but at least I, in, in in our existence, there seem to be plenty of opportunities for. Uh, planets to, to go. Unfortunately, in your lifetime, um, if, if general relativity is correct and that you can't transmit information faster than the speed of light, you can't move faster than the speed of light in your local frame. If, that's, if that is true, um, it means that for you to experience a conversation with a, um, an extraterrestrial that's out there, Right? You just say hello, it goes out there, they hear it, they turn around and say hi back to you, right? This, this yeah, ping yeah. pong. Um, that speed of, of ping pong requires a speed of light. So yeah. let's say that you're going to live another 80 years. That means that if something, according to relativity, is more than 40 light years away, you don't have enough time in your lifetime for a ping and a pong, even if yeah. it was just going to be perfect. That 40 light year zone has been pretty much explored. Um, and so far, although we can miss something, um, the chances of finding you know, ET in that 40 light year zone and having a conversation in your lifetime is low. Now it's possible they can come here, right? In your lifetime. More likely, we will be able to detect the presence of life on a planet out there see the signatures of complex chemistry in this atmosphere, maybe, e maybe even if they're intelligent and they're sending out radio signals to hear their version of I Love Lucy or, 
or uh, um, you know, or Saturday Night Live or whatever the thing is. But but just saying here's a planet. There's interesting chemistry going on. Look at these complex organic molecules. Look at lightning. Those are things that are going to be begin to be possible by things like the Square Comet Array radio telescope, the James Webb uh, infrared telescope. That'll help us. And I think what'll happen, I predict, this is my prediction, it'll happen is that like black holes, the first discoveries are going to be probabilistic. Some of them will say, this might have life on it, and they'll be discarded by further, further you know, fraction of asking questions. But eventually, I think we'll find some planets that where the this looks like there's life will stick. By the way, that may occur when we send probes to Europa, a moon around Jupiter that might have a, has a large ocean underneath that might have life. It also may be discovered by probes on Mars as a potential explanation for how methane is being generated in Mars. So we actually might find life still within our solar system, but I, I, would, I would not be surprised within your lifetime that it'll first be controversial and then will become routine about there appear to be life over there, 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 and there. Yeah. At great distances that will take many generations to cross if relativity is correct. But who knows, maybe a warp drive will, will turn out to be a reality. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, so we are approaching uh, the end of the show here, but I want to take some audience questions. So audience, feel free to throw out some questions. And I see one here in, uh, I don't know if it's Swedish, Finnish, I don't know, language I don't understand. But th feel free to throw out some questions, audience. Uh, but while... I am waiting for them to get that. Uh, when it comes to uh, like I, I th the first real message we sent on purpose was uh, was that on Voyager one or two? The, well, there the were there actually were radio telescopes, but radio missions, right? So you might say on purpose when they yeah. were broadcasting radio signals when. People like Marconi and people like Tesla and other people were beginning to send out radio signals. They were also sending it out into space. Uh, so, and there's been early radio telescopes that have that have been done directional beaming, right? Because when you send it out in space, it radiates, it loses power, the bits get muddled uh, as as you as you go out farther. So, uh, that may be less. Uh, able than to send something in in direction. There's also been lasers, right? Light is another means. Um, optical light is another means to, to send out uh, information. Um, and of course, as you said, on the Voyager probes, there were um, uh, gold disks uh, that that supposedly an intelligent civilization, if they were recover this artifact, might see with the explanation of the ideograms of how to. Um, you know how to record this thing. Uh, Carl Sagan was very uh, instrumental in some of these early pioneer and Voyager probes having these messages on them. Um, that should they be discovered by someone out there, um, they might learn about us. The question is, will we will we will we be around for them to come back and and a chat with them? Um, I mean, that would be this, that would be this, nice. This, you know, maybe, I'm a planetary maybe. scientist. Because I, I love, I mean, to me, planets are exciting. I love, stars are fine. But one of the things that, that if you, all these processes from the Big Bang and galaxy formation, and star formation and supernovas and so forth are all building up to what? Building planets where on planets like this one, imperfect chemical replication occurs, things evolve, evolution takes place, and you have people who sit in a, a Google Hangout and, and discuss life elsewhere. That, I think, is why it drives me to study, study planets. And, and the amazing acceleration of our capability from, from how can we possibly detect a planet elsewhere to now they're coming in um, at a pretty good rate and we may, and people like SETI that are doing a really uh, scanning for, for messages um, plus our space probes going out there are going to, I think, be able to, uh, if there's life that we can detect out there, um, you know, has a chance 
perhaps within the lifetime of many of the people that are listening to this program, of discovering life elsewhere. And I think it's going to be a very interesting um, uh, societal experiment that once we science has said, yes, there's a pretty credible evidence that over there there's life, um, uh, the reactions to it will be interesting. I suspect um, there will be accommodations of, of shock and surprise and denial and anger and joy and so forth. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it, it, uh, I definitely think it'll be uh, kind of like any new big thing in science. There's a lot of, uh, it's like, oh, is this really what we think we found? And there's some excitement and then a lot of disagreement. Uh, but then eventually we, we figure it out if that's like when, yeah. when it came to the Higgs, it was a lot like that. Yes. Everyone was like, oh, is this the Higgs? Is it it? And then some people are like, no, nah, it's not the Higgs. And, some and so you, like, yeah. more, you, you ask more questions right? yeah, and, exactly. and you challenge it. And if it's can to survive, it becomes more and more credible. So the, the black holes were first thought as merely a mathematical uh, uh, bizarre phenomenon that the universe couldn't possibly engage in. And then there were possible black holes discovered. Some of them were discarded. And then Cygnus X1 came about. It was hard to discard. And now we have really solid evidence that black holes really exist. And then you're going to ask more questions, and you have things like Hawking radiation and other amazing stuff happening. And there's there's a whole because because again that's science. We we once you think you have an answer, you generate lots more questions and begin yeah. to to explore. So the search for life elsewhere, which is one of the things that drives me as a planetary scientist, um, is going to, I believe, I suspect will happen that same way. And um, given the, the pace it is, I think that people listening here in their lifetime will experience the joys of, is it, is it life out there? If not, discard, maybe, you know, back and forth to that thing sticks to, okay, therefore what? Uh, so we actually got a super chat from a Clippy Paperclip. Thank you. Thank you, Clippy. Uh, and uh, what I find really amusing here is how there are quite a bit of flat earthers in, in the chat, which is great. I'm pretty sure they just continuously look up flat earth stuff and see what the what kind of stuff is going on in that. Uh, and then they just look up, you know, most recent. <laughs> By the way, I, I, I don't mean to insult flat earthers. I mean to invite them in the exploration of process. And so you're right, I shouldn't have called it a religion, but I would say ask questions. And um, I think appropriate questions, but ask questions not from a point of view of bias, but to test, right? That's a good thing. And, and, and be sure that you challenge your flat earth models and yeah, conduct it, experiments and, and see whether they survive or not. That's the... Because yeah. the, the only reason uh, we got so far in so many facets of science is because we continuously try to disprove the things we believe yeah. because that's how falsification works exactly. so like if you, you if you believe in a flat earth cool uh tr try to falsify your model look at your model and think okay what cannot possibly be true or, or like how, how would we prove this wrong i guess and, Absolutely, and, and, and transform that so-called belief uh, and dogma into a series of questions because understand the universe is going to do whatever it does regardless of what you believe. Yeah. The universe doesn't care squat what you believe, right? It, it, is a, it is a, and don't sound from saying this is truth and we're being denied this sort of stuff. Ask the questions. Do like I did. You can measure the distance to the sun. You can measure the distance to the moon. You can travel to these spots. You can do the experiments, right? That 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 I've 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 done. Um, there is a total solar eclipse that occurs on in on December fourth, twenty twenty one, in Antarctica. Um, there is a group of people that are going to serve this. Wait, there's hold gonna on, be a, hold on. That's 
That's that's that can't be possible in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> and and one of the side trips will be able to go to the South Pole and back if you want to do that as well. Um, that the eclipse will occur around eighty degrees south. There, it'll it'll be a fun thing, and you can come in and, and enjoy the a, a, an amazing environment. Antarctica is incredibly beautiful. It's an incredibly wonderful place, um, and I would encourage you not simply on a ship along the coast seeing penguins and icebergs, but in the deep interior is an amazing place, um, and you can do these things. So ask questions, right? That's and and you know I challenge the 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 the, the round Earth model all the time, and I ask questions and do experiments, and so far it's it survived. Yeah, it is it is continuously verified, and that is uh, and not only that, but we can make uh, it has predictive capability. And that's why I say that there isn't a, you know, the science is not a conspiracy, right? It, it, we're constantly challenging stuff. So I'm constantly, you know, challenging relativity. Um, and, and, and in college, I did lots of experiments trying to challenge um, quantum mechanics as well. It was a yeah, definitely. Things. And and that's the that's the proper approach to, you know, that seems bizarre. Let me ask questions to see if I can have an experiment to build a hypothesis to challenge that, to knock something out. And if you're able to um, observe a finding that is not fit by the model, you become a celebrated scientist for doing what? Asking the right question at the right time to the right people. Yeah, and this is actually something I was uh, wanting to ask you. What's, what's your position on uh, string theory? Because so far I am just like, I, I, I can see string theory and not being a mathematician, like I can get the basics and see that okay, the math works out, but it's not like we haven't verified anything right now. Like I'm on the side of QFT because that seems the much more likely scenario. So the string models, I think, are very interesting mathematics, and yeah. they they hold hope that they will, I think, rise to a level of theory. The reason why I don't like the term string theory yeah, me is, not a, me is not a pejorative, but that we have not yet had the testability of, of string theory. Fitting yeah. your model to, to uh, conform to observation is not a, not a predictive power. I don't say, but by the other hand, I think there's a lot of value in exploring the mathematics and to, and to get to the point of being able to, to test it. Just like the you know the mini universes models and other sorts of things, there people are working on trying to test, figuring out the right questions to ask. It, it there 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 may be someone out there who's able to ask the right question for which our present models fail and string models succeeds. At that point, we can elevate it to to a theory. Um, but it's very interesting mathematics. Yeah. I, but again. Mathematics can can exist independently of the universe. Your mathematical model has no bearing on the universe. You're just going to do whatever it does, regardless of what math you use, right? It's it's your job to try to ask the right questions, to model, and to make a prediction, have an observation, and do a correlation there. So I'm I hope that the string theory excuse me, the three model people, it's even got me doing, <laughs> the people doing modeling can elevate it to theory. Because yeah. uh, I think there's some, it holds some really interesting um, opportunities there. There's, there's, there's a big, there's a number, I think there's a number of great questions that are happening in, in, in cosmology. And one of them is the, how do we better integrate relativity and quantum mechanics? Um, and other questions are, asking questions about extreme conditions of physics, such as what we, what we hypothesize occurred very shortly after the Big Bang. Yeah. Um, another question about uh, galaxy formation the, and the first star formations are, are something that we're beginning to get the data to be able to ask questions there. Another question is, are we alone in life in our, in our, our universe, or is there life elsewhere, and if so, what? Um, you know, another another great I think another again, great great question is about the, the the fate of the universe. Where you know, predicting the far future of the universe and how it will you know it will it transform itself from now to, to then. Um, 
uh, there's a question about black holes um, that need to be, you know, be answered. There's a question about gravity waves that are there. While we've detected gravity waves, the, the next level questions are just beginning to, to develop. Um, and it's going to be exciting to see those things. And I encourage particularly young people to, if you're not a, maybe you're not comfortable with the language of mathematics and being a scientist, but be science literate and to follow news about science. Um, yeah, and, and I also don't suggest pop science articles no. or sites. Oh, God, I hate those. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, even though it might be more tedious to read, uh, and you might have to do some Googling, just occasionally read something from a science journal. Don't take anything from a pop, for like a pop science site, like because they, they commonly misrepresent the articles that they're citing. True, and and if, and and at least in the, it's the style that's common in astronomy journals. Um, what you can do is take a journal article, read the title, read the abstract, and read the conclusion. Right? They those tend to be um, a little bit more understandable, and then you can look up terms. But they oftentimes define their terms in the introduction. So right. you see right. this. What's this m sub e thing? They'll say mass of the Earth m sub e. Um, uh, so that's a, even though you may not understand the bulk of the stuff in the middle, um, title, abstract, conclusion, introduction, right? It's a good way to, to get a notion of, of how it is. And there are also um, uh, resources such as Science News, it comes every two weeks, where there are science literate reporters that, that talk to the people doing, asking the scientific questions. And, and produce a, an article that's relatively literate. So you'll hear in the press, um, uh, scientists um, discover water on, on extrasolar uh, Earth-like planet. And wait a couple weeks for it to show up in a place like Science News, where the report will have a discussion and they'll sit there and say, well, we actually found a planet that seems to have lots of water in its atmosphere um, more than average, and we find that curious, right? That's a, uh, you'll get the more of the details there, but you can become at least science literate. So when there's a discovery, you can appreciate it. When, when we discovered the accelerating universe, right to our shock, you can appreciate the magnitude of the questions being asked. Um, yeah, that was, that was super important in the history yes. of science. So, I mean, so, so that's just, just in terms of appreciation of things, and, and, and again, continue to ask questions. Don't start with dogma. Don't start with this is what it is. Ask questions and then do the testing um, yourself. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and it doesn't look like we have uh, any questions necessarily. Um, and I think I'm all out of questions. But I want to encourage, by the way, people to become patrons of your, your group, uh, Walking Atheists on there. I'm a patron myself. Uh, I, think it's, it, I think it's great to encourage uh, people who question and examine stuff, and that's one of the things you guys do. Your, your Sunday, uh, uh, I guess it's, it's, it's uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, noon Central uh, things where, where you're, you, know, you guys go out and, and do the job of reading through the Bible. Yeah, you're telling me. <laughs> but you're, no, currently so. in, you're currently in Numbers, which is a mathematician, is a nice... <laughs> oh, they haven't said many numbers in Numbers yet. No, no, it was just at the very beginning when they were listing, like, <laughs> hey, here's some big amounts of people. <laughs> but, uh, but but that's, that's I encourage folks to listen to her because there's a, you know, we, we have a nice commentary in the side chat as you're saying some things that are Surprising, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, th thank you for that. Definitely. Yeah. To to all those that are not uh, that are not patrons, definitely consider becoming one. You get some cool rewards. And speaking of rewards, I will be sending out uh, those soon uh, for people whose payment have already went through. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We might have a question here. Uh, why did the one flat earther build a rocket to see if the earth was flat when it is cheaper to fly to New Zealand and charter a flight over Antarctica? I actually saw an answer to this. The the This flight that he did was just to see if he could do it. It wasn't necessarily to see 
if the Earth was flat, that's for like the next flight or something. I mean, uh, I would think that 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 building a high altitude balloon and putting a you know a go cam there with a you know, for example, records on data you can retrieve or something mm -hmm. is a is an easier way to get to extremely high altitudes. Um, certainly, high altitudes above where where humans could breathe would be a, a really fascinating way to do that. And while you're up there, you can do other things about you know detecting cosmic rays and other sorts of of, of, of amazing stuff out there um, that you can do once you're once you're there. Even in sort of you know relatively uh, low orbit or, or low sub low orbit that that a that a high altitude weather balloon is can do um, it's certainly safer so you don't have to put yourself at risk but but it is amazing to see the the, the gradation between thick atmosphere and thin atmosphere that these things um, weather balloons can reach yeah uh, so yeah I think uh, that would be the end of the show then everybody uh talking fl uh, flat earthers and not and we actually got this huge uh difference in likes and dislikes uh <laughs> because there are a lot of flat earthers here disliking this that's my guess um well we have, as, i appreciate the dislikes but but hey, you know i i, I love the dislikes it helps me actually any viewer engagement helps my channel so thank you flat earthers yes. um and but there, there's, there's no ice wall keeping you out, out of Antarctica. You can go to the South Pole. You can measure the distance to the sun. You can measure the curvature of the Earth. Um, you can measure the shape of the Earth. You can you know, measure the rotation. You can do all these sort of things. And, you know, as someone who has measured the distance to the stars and so forth, it's an amazing universe. Move out of your dogma and ask questions. Questions. Yes. Questioning the round Earth model, I think, is a very scientific process. Doing it from the point of view of trying to prove your dogma is is a mistake, and of course, if you're a troll, you know there's other things to troll on. So, <laughs> what yeah. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining us, and Landon, it was absolutely wonderful having you here. Thank you. I, I hope to, to do it again, and uh, best wishes for your group, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully you can get more uh, more patrons and more uh, uh, audience. You guys deserve yes. it. All right, and uh, audience, thank you for joining us, and uh, you will have a Forged Fiction video on Thursday. Have no doubt about that. All right, have a Ask good night. Ask questions. Ask, yeah, ask questions. questions.